This is the third stress and health video and hopefully the last one. And we are continuing on with our look at the tendon befriend issue and whether it's a female response to stress. Now, the last thing we talked about was the fact that the hormone oxytocin, which is um, secreted by both males and females under stress, uh, makes rats and humans calmer, more social, and less fearful. And uh, since both genders actually secrete it, Interestingly, the male hormone testosterone seems to reduce its effect, whereas the female hormone of estrogen amplifies the effect. These hormonal differences might explain why men have higher rates of stress-related health problems than women do, and why the classic symptoms of heart attacks, such as pain radiating down the arm, are more common in men than women experiencing heart attacks. Women are more likely to experience a shortness of breath. Uh, Dr. Taylor, who we talked about in the last video, who was the uh, lady who focused on the idea that most of the stress studies had been done on males and even male uh, rats, and her colleagues, explained sex differences in response to stress in evolutionary terms. Long ago, when our ancestors were hunter-gatherers who did not build permanent villages, predators, perhaps including human competitors, were a constant danger. Under those environmental conditions, it was adaptive for men to confront danger by fighting or to divert an enemy by fleeing while women guarded the children. Taylor argues that this adaptation became hardwired and remains with us today. Now, other psychologists are quick to point out that the difference could just as likely be the result of learning and cultural conditioning. As Pavlov demonstrated, physiological responses, whether salivation or hormonal production, can be altered through conditioning. So does an inborn physiological response to stress cause females to seek and provide comfort? Or does a culturally conditioned seek and provide comfort response stimulate the physiological changes, and in this case, oxytocin? For her part, Taylor thinks that the most important message of this research is that people respond to stress differently. Um, most studies of stress previously had looked at lone male subjects, perhaps in group situations, males too have a tend to befriend response to stress. Proving or disproving this would take additional research. So what's interesting here is the nexus between the hormone change and the behavior itself. And again, a, a, a very interesting chicken and egg question that you'll find in a lot in psychology. So let's now move on to actual the actual response of the body beyond just oxytocin to stress. So let's talk stress and health. Does stress cause disease? Can a positive attitude cure or slow the progress of cancer? Well, the biology of stress or how we react to danger, or when the body reacts to danger, includes these things. The hypothalamus, the center deep in your brain, is reacting to your perception of danger if when it occurs, organizing a general response that affects several organs throughout your body. Almost immediately, the hypothalamus stimulates the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system and the adrenal glands to release hormones such as adrenaline and norepinephrine into the blood, leading to an increase in heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, and perspiration. Other organs respond, such as the liver that increases the available sugar in the blood for extra energy, and even your bone marrow increases the white blood cell count to combat infection. Conversely, the rate of some body functions is decreased, such as the rate of digestion, which is obviously of less importance when we're facing imminent danger. And by the way, this actually explains why when you're nervous and when you're stressed, you'll feel the butterflies in your stomach. What you're actually feeling is the blood leaving the digestive tract and going to other places to prepare you for quick action. Um, the noted psychologist Walter Cannon in 1929 first described the basic elements of uh, the fight or flight response as he called the sequence of events that occurred as a result of being under intense stress. Uh, he called it this because it appeared its primary purpose was to prepare an animal to respond to external threats by either attacking or fleeing them. Um, extending Cannon's theory, or the, and by the way, that's Cannon as in Cannon Bard, the emotion theory. Extending Cannon's theory of fight or flight response, the Canadian psychologist Hans Soleil held that we react to 
to physical and psychological stressors in three stages. He collectively called them the General Adaptation Syndrome, or GAS, and here are our three stages. So when you face a stressful situation, the first thing you are in is the alarm reaction. This is the first response. It begins when the body recognizes it must fend off physical or psychological danger. Emotions run high. Activity of the sympathetic nervous system is increased and we become more sensitive and alert. We mobilize our coping resources to deal with the threat. As the alarm st uh, at the alarm stage, we might see either direct or defensive coping strategies. If neither of these approaches reduces the stress, we eventually enter the second stage of adaptation. The second stage, so this is, you've gone into a stressful situation, the alarm stage hasn't managed to settle it, and so you move into stage two. Now in this one, physical symptoms and other forms of strain appear as we struggle against increasing psychological disorganization. We intensify our use of both direct and defensive coping techniques. If we succeed, we return to the normal state, but if the stress is extreme or prolonged, we may turn in desperation to inappropriate coping techniques and cling to them rigidly. Um, we then begin to really wear our system out. So it's at this point when things start to get pretty rugged, and if you still can't fix it, then you move into the stage you never really want to be in, and that's stage three of exhaustion. When this happens, we draw on increasingly ineffective defense mechanisms in a desperate attempt to bring the stress under control. Some people lose touch with reality at this sign. Some show signs of emotional disorders or mental illness even at this stage. Others show signs of what you would call burnout. Um, physical symptoms such as skin or stomach problems may erupt, and some victims of burnout may turn to alcohol or drugs to cope with the stress-induced exhaustion. In other words, the physiological reactions that prepared us to cope effectively in alarm and resistance phases weaken us in the long run. If the stress continues, the person may suffer irreparable physical or psychological damage or even death. Now, you've probably heard that stress can affect your immune system, and we'll get to that in just a moment, but I do want to take a little side trip here to talk a little bit about some experiments that were actually done back in the 1970s with uh, monkeys. Um, one of the things that was kind of interesting is that uh, it was through testing of monkeys that they actually verified that you uh, psychologically, uh, because you psychologically feel stress, you can physically then uh, actually hurt your own system. Uh, the famous study we're talking about here was one called the executive monkey. And in this particular situation, what they were looking for was something they thought they saw in executives in big business at that point. And that was that they were under such stress that physically they began to develop certain symptoms, such as, and probably the most prominent, an ulcer in the stomach. Now, an ulcer in the stomach is caused by the uh, acid in the stomach actually eating through the stomach lining and creating a hole in the stomach. And so in order to test this, which seemed to be very prominent in businessmen at, and businesswomen, for that matter, at that point, um, they put... Uh, monkeys in situations where they were unable to get away, but they had to make decisions in order to keep themselves from being shocked. And the decisions got more and more difficult, and the uh, possibility that they could make these decisions and do them correctly became uh, smaller and smaller to the point where, obviously, the monkeys were under severe stress, psychological stress. And what they found was that very quickly the monkeys began to develop the same ulcers that many executives seem to be developing as well. So uh, this is an example of what we have as a result of stress that can occur. But the next thing we'll move on to will be um, the heart disease situation. So let's talk a little bit about stress and heart disease. Coronary heart disease, or CHD, is the leading cause of death and disability in the United States. Frequent or chronic stress can damage the heart and blood vessels. For example, the stress hormone cortisol increases blood pressure, which weakens the wall of the blood vessels and can trigger arrhythmias, which are erratic heartbeats that may lead to sudden, sudden death. Um, uh, and this also increases cholesterol levels, which cause a plaque buildup and over time arteri arteri <laughs> arterial sclerosis or hardening of the arteries. In addition to the amount of stress, the way in which individuals respond to stress is a predictor of heart disease. In the 1950s, two researchers identified a behavior pattern they called the type A personality. 
Now, these are people who respond to uh, life events with impatience, hostility, competitiveness, urgency, and constant striving. Uh, type A personalities are twice as likely as type B personalities, and you can see their characteristics here, which are much calmer, to have developed cardiovascular disorders. Current research indicates that some aspects of type A behavior are more toxic than others, especially chronic anger and hostility, which do indeed predict heart disease. A recent six-year study followed 13,000 people who appeared free of heart disease, but when the study and when the study began. Those who scored high on an anger scale were 2.5 times more likely to have heart attacks or sudden cardiac deaths during the next six years than their calmer peers. In other words, impatience and ambition may not be damaging, but constant annoyance is. Uh, not surprisingly, the researchers have reported some success in reducing the incidence of CHD through the use of counseling designed to diminish hostility in patients with type A behavior. Surprisingly, evidence that depression is associated with heart disease and premature death is actually mounting. People suffering from clinical depression feel sad and lethargic, which is the opposite of type A. It turns out that, although they may appear to have given up, their bodies are in a constant state of fight-or-flight arousal, and as we've seen, long-term exposure to stress hormones damages the heart and the blood vessels. All right, let's take a quick look at stress and the immune system. The relatively new field of psychoneuroimmunology, or PNI, studies the interaction between stress on one hand and the immune, endocrine, and nervous system activity on the other. Uh, chronic stress, or even the stress associated with things that are not quite so chronic, like college exams, have been linked to suppress, suppressed functioning of the immune system. Psychoneuroimmunologists have also established a possible relationship between stress and cancer. Stress doesn't cause cancer, but it apparently impairs the immune system so that the cancerous cells are better able to establish themselves and spread themselves throughout the body. So a great amount of, a great amount of the research uh, shows that when you are under stress, and remember stress is something that you interpret or perceive, uh, that as you probably have heard from your parents or from other people throughout your lifetime, uh, it can actually cause your immune system to become weakened. So too much stress, too much overindulgence of everything or working too hard, not getting enough sleep, all of those things can lead to the immune system actually beginning to fail, which can cause you to be sick. So this is one of those old ideas that was actually fully supported by the research that's been done in more recent times. All right, so let's look at the other side of the equation. What can we possibly do to make things better? First, let's reduce our stress by calming down. Stress may be a part of life, but there are proven ways to reduce the negative impacts on your body and health. Um, taking things easy, relaxation, uh, realize that you control things and that stress is never as difficult as you think it might be. So. Uh, calm down. Secondly, reach out. Get help from others. Talk to others. The, it's amazing that when you find out that other people are really facing the same problems that you are, it actually makes it easier for you to handle because you don't think you're the only one. And also, they will might be able to give you tips on how to handle the situation. Now, religion and altruism, this is kind of an interesting suggestion, but most major religions have some component to them that helps you to understand that you control your own world and that you decide what's stressful. And most of what we think is very stressful doesn't necessarily need to be. As Yoda tells us there, an ignorant state stress is, an emergency it believes everything is. Probably the best way to look at stress and think about how we probably overdo it is if you want to test your memory, try to recall what you were worrying about a year ago today. And so all of these things that you see here on the page are good suggestions. Uh, altruism, help other people. Um, it makes you feel better about yourself and it also keeps you from dwelling upon your own issues. So um, these are ideas that uh, many people support. You can also use proactive coping. And this is anticipating stressful events and taking advanced steps to avoid them or to minimize their impact. So this is plan ahead. Be prepared. And we'll finish up this last slide and give a couple of other comments in our next video.